Amid the strongmen and murderers who fought the Prohibition gangster wars, only one mob boss built his crime empire on the strength of his word. A handshake from Meyer Lansky was worth more than the strongest contracts that a battery of lawyers could put together. Meyer Lansky, the casino king, the quiet godfather, the very image of humility and modesty. He dressed very well. He never had loud clothes. He said, I don't want to be too flashy. A shrewd master manipulator who claimed that he never killed a man. He did business and made his living through men who regularly killed people, and so is equally guilty. Lansky turned a natural genius for numbers into a multi-million dollar gambling empire. High rollers made and lost fortunes at his casino tables. And the $100 bills were that high. Oh, it was just incredible. Did I enjoy it? I'm oh, sure it was profitable, too. To escape the law, he fled halfway around the world. But it wasn't far enough. Meyer Lansky was born around 1902. His real birth date is not known. His family lived in the Russian town of Grudna, a center of trade on the Polish border with a thriving Jewish community. Little Meyer studied Hebrew and went to this synagogue often with his beloved grandparents. But Jewish life under the Russian czars was not easy. As a boy, Meyer witnessed firsthand the brutality of the pogroms, the methodical persecution of the Jews by the czar's dreaded Cossack brigades. When the Jewish community where he lived was suffering particularly, there was a young Jew who stood up and suggested that instead of just lying down, the community should fight back, that young Jewish men should go off to the woods and train and use weapons. And that appealed to Lansky, and all his life he had a chip on his shoulder. And that story was what he produced to uh, rationalize what he became. Meyer's family decided to flee Russia for the United States in March 1911. The ocean voyage was rough. But tough nine-year-old Meyer was too proud to be seasick in front of his mother. He went out on deck to get sick over the railing. For two years, the family lived in an apartment house in a quiet neighborhood in Brooklyn. When Meyer's father could no longer afford the rent, he moved his family to a tenement on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. There, more than half a million people, mostly Irish, Italians, and Jews, were packed into two square miles of crowded city blocks. Meyer got excellent grades in school, but when he wasn't studying, he was out on the streets. He was sucked in right away by the criminal world, and the most seductive part of that world was gambling. A story Lansky always used to tell was of the night before the Jewish Sabbath in the Lower East Side, when his mother would entrust him with a pot of stew to be taken to the baker's oven, and he was always sent with a nickel to pay the baker for the use of the heat. And on the way, one night, he saw a crap game uh, on the sidewalk, and he was drawn to put down the nickel. And of course, he lost it and had to go back home and tell everybody there'd be no hot stew the next day. And he always described the shame of that moment, but more than the shame, his anger at having been so stupid. Lansky resolved that he would never be the sucker again. He had discovered that he had a remarkable gift for numbers. He could calculate in his head the odds and the payoffs from games of chance. He started running backroom crap games, taking other suckers' money and stuffing it into his mattress. By the age of 16, he had quit school, and he had a tough enough reputation that older hoods hired him to be what was called a shtarka, Yiddish for enforcer. His principal work was on behalf of local unions, beating up scabs, the men who worked in factories during strikes. But Lansky had greater ambitions than being a small-time hustler, and the ghetto soon offered him two partners who would pave the way to the top, Ben Siegel and Charlie Lucky Luciano. He won over Luciano, after Lucky and his gang of Italians cornered Little Meyer on the street and threatened him. Meyer called their bluff. The stories he used to tell it was that he said to uh, Luciano, uh, who was the head of this gang, go f yourself. And suddenly, Luciano was confronted by a weak-seeming little Jewish boy who wouldn't lie down, who wouldn't be pushed around. And that was the beginning of the friendship between Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky. Lansky met Ben Siegel, 
when he helped the handsome young hoodlum escape from the police after a gang brawl. Together with Ben, known on the street as Bugsy because of his psychopathic rages, Lansky formed his first street outfit, a troop of Jewish hoods called the Bug and Meyer Gang. Meyer was the brains, Benny was the brawn. He was the unguided missile, and Meyer was the guidance system who would use him cynically often uh, in later life for what he wanted to accomplish. With Siegel as his strongman, Lansky directed the work of the young gang, robberies, extortion, and as always, gambling. When Prohibition began in January 1920, they moved easily into bootlegging, shipping illegal whiskey into the States from Canada and England. But Lansky was still small time. What he needed was a mentor. Then, at a bar mitzvah in 1921, Lansky met the veteran bootlegger and schemer, Arnold the Brain Rothstein. Rothstein was widely regarded as the cleverest gangster in New York. He financed deals and let young hoods like Lansky and his buddies take the risks on the street. Maya Lansky worked for him, Lucky Luciano worked for him, Ben Siegel worked for him, Frank Costello worked for him, Legs Diamond worked for him, and I think that was how Lansky made the next step, the next jump. Rothstein taught Lansky when the bribe was more effective than the bullet, and Lansky expanded his tiny chain of gambling parlors while the cops looked the other way. Then, in November 1928, Arnold the Brain was murdered. Lansky wasn't involved, but the killing allowed Meyer and his pals to go big time. With the death of Rothstein, they're looking at the Rothstein empire and the viable role they had played in some segments of it, and they can say to themselves, it's now all ours. It would not be long before Rothstein's students became masters of gangland New York, but it would be Meyer Lansky alone who inherited Rothstein's special mantle. Lansky would become the next great mafia brain. As the Roaring Twenties roared to a close, the New York rackets were firmly under the control of Meyer Lansky and his mob cronies. Every mobster had his specialty. Lansky's was gambling. But to run a high-profit casino, Lansky needed help from communities that would turn a blind eye to illegal betting in exchange for a piece of the action. One such town was Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. In the late 1920s, Lansky's mentor, Arnold Rothstein, had introduced him to Saratoga. By day, rich and poor risked their money downtown at the world-famous racetrack. At night, the betting moved to opulent nightclubs called Lake Houses, early predecessors of the Las Vegas casinos. Lansky ran the gambling rooms in two of the finest lake houses, the Piping Rock and the Arrowhead Inn. There, he fine-tuned the persona that he would use for his entire career, quiet, soft-spoken, and honest. One thing a real dyed-in-the-wool gambler looks for is a fair gambling operation. And Meyer was always fair. He abhorred bust-out joints. That's where they rigged up roulette tables with a battery operation or phony dice, which they call top or bottom or slice dice. Meyer would have none of it. He insisted on a fair, honest game, and that's how he built his reputation. Not to mention a modest fortune. By his late 20s, hundreds of thousands of dollars were passing through Lansky's hands. And like many successful young businessmen, Lansky decided to settle down. In the spring of 1929, Lansky married a beautiful young Jewish woman, Anne Citrin. Anne was a friend of Bugsy Siegel's girlfriend, Esther Krakauer. The couple's double dated, and when the Lanskys got married on May 9th, Bugsy served as witness. At first, Meyer was happy with domestic life, and Anne was content shopping along Fifth Avenue for their new home. But the reality of his life, away at strange hours, not being able to confide in anybody, poisoned his ability to have any sort of decent personal relationship. The birth of their first child, Buddy, only made the situation worse. Buddy suffered from cerebral palsy and could scarcely use his legs. Anne Lansky blamed her husband. God punish you for doing the rotten criminal things you're doing, and uh, he visited your sins upon our boy. See? Now, whether it's true or not, subconsciously, Meyer had a guilt complex. Lansky was desperate to cure his son. He read medical journals. He rented an apartment in Boston so Buddy could be treated by a doctor there. So you have this dichotomy. Uh, he's pouring his love 
and the positive side of his feelings and emotions into trying to make some redemption of his son's life. And then he's criminal. One of the most powerful criminals in New York City. Unlike other gang leaders, Lansky was learning to avoid the vendettas and police attention brought on by mob violence. Instead, he consolidated his power with his own personal method, fairness. In the underworld, a handshake from Meyer Lansky was worth more than the strongest contracts that a battery of lawyers could put together, dotting the I's and crossing the T's with the whereases and the therefores. Uh, he, he was a man whose word was good. He also chose a lifestyle opposite to that of his partners. Ben Siegel was a consummate ladies' man. Lucky Luciano basked in his gangster reputation, but Lansky dressed and lived quietly. He was fastidious in his personal habits. His fedoras were always placed carefully on their hat stands, his pressed shirts on their monogrammed hangers in his closet. I'm telling you, he was as low key as they come and shy and retiring. If you can visualize Meyer to be a shy and retiring, and he was shy and retiring. But when it came to doing business, Lansky could be just as ruthless as his murderous cronies. In 1931, Meyer helped his pal Lucky Luciano take over the New York mob. To do it, Lucky had to eliminate the two rival bosses at the time, Salvatore Maranzano and Joe the Boss Masseria. Lucky had no trouble bumping off Masseria, but Maranzano was a harder target. He trusted no one, especially not young Italian climbers like Luciano. That's where Lansky came in. Meyer's Jewish gunmen were the ones who turned up at Maranzano's office. They were dispatched by Meyer Lansky. They said they were agents from the Treasury Department, and they were going to have to take a look at the books. And Mr. Maranzano came out and read Levine. Very close to Meyer Lansky was one of the gunmen who shot uh, Maranzano. They also stabbed him, and they departed. With the bloodshed over, Lucky Luciano was king of the hill, and standing beside the throne was Meyer Lansky. Excluded from the Italian mafia because he was Jewish, Lansky was now calling the shots in New York anyway as Luciano's right-hand man. But just as Lansky had reached this pinnacle, his triumph was cut short. In 1933, prohibition ended, and with it, the stream of cash that bootlegging had delivered to the mob. And an even greater setback for Lansky came in 1936, when Lucky Luciano was found guilty of running prostitution rings in Manhattan. Lucky was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison. When Luciano was put away, the New York police authorities mentioned six people that they thought might take over, and Lansky, whose name was misspelt, was mentioned. Lansky was smart enough to say to his friend Ben Siegel, you and I are gonna be next. Siegel headed west to Hollywood. Lansky headed south to scout out gambling opportunities in new and fertile terrain, Florida. What Lansky wanted was a location to set up his next generation of gambling houses, and he fixed his eye on a beach town just across the county line from Miami, the village of Hallandale. Officials there were especially forgiving of illegal betting. Well-run casinos would draw the tourists. The only problem, these games were already controlled by a local gangster. Lansky was going to need help muscling in, but he was having trouble recruiting new thugs from his old neighborhoods. The era of the young tough guy Jewish gunman is coming to an end. These young Jewish boys now are now going to be looking to go to law school, to go to medical school. So at that point, you can see that at every enterprise that he gets involved in, he's got to have an Italian partner. The key partner was Vincent Alo, better known as Jimmy Blue Eyes. Alo made the Hallandale gambling impresarios an offer they couldn't refuse. He told them that whether they liked it or not, Meyer Lansky was taking over. Lansky built three casinos and put his brother Jake Lansky in charge. Then he smoothed all the ruffled feathers. Anything that could be paid off with money, Meyer did not fear because as long as you could pay, pay off somebody or pay something somehow, that was satisfied him. For a start, Lansky paid every single family in town $35 a week to tolerate the casinos and to stay away from them. At the time, Joseph Varon was the Hallandale city attorney. He too benefited from Meyer Lansky's generosity. I go to a gambling joint, you know, Saturday night was so I, play a little bit, and they see that whether I won or not, they'd give me a stack of chips. Florida gambling boomed. 
Lansky maintained his Saratoga tradition of spectacular shows and top quality food. They were places that were patronized by the finest people and had seating capacity, some of them as high as 800 people. And some of the finest people of the United States patronized these places. The trademark Lansky honesty brought in high rollers from all over the country. And the $100 bills were that high. Oh, it was just incredible. I knew one fellow by the name of Joe Milstein. One week, Joe Milstein lost $800,000, all in cash. Now, that's just one player. The house extracts a certain amount of, of every play, and as a result, their take was monumental. Did I enjoy it? I'm oh, sure it was profitable, too. Profitable because Lansky and his partners were extracting millions in illegal earnings out of casinos protected by the New York Mafia. But as Lansky was making his mark in the tropics, a shadow was looming over the rest of the world. The rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany was a painful reminder for the Russian-born Jew of his family's struggle with oppression. On his trips to New York, Lansky began to sniff out rallies of Nazi sympathizers like the German-American Bund. Then he would show up with a truckload of goons and break up the rally. But his big chance to be a part of the war effort came when Navy intelligence decided to join forces with the mob to keep the New York docks clear of Nazi saboteurs. The Navy knew that the Sicilian Mafia controlled the waterfront and figured that even in prison, Meyer's pal Lucky Luciano still controlled the Sicilians. Only one man could take the Navy's request to Luciano, Meyer Lansky. I'll help you, the little man told the Navy brass. It's patriotism. Over the next year, Lansky met with Lucky in prison a dozen times. And in fact, there was no sabotage on the waterfront. More importantly, Lansky used the meetings to solidify his connections with the Italian mob. After the war, Lansky took his second eldest son, Paul, on a cross-country drive to Las Vegas. The purpose of the trip? To keep tabs on the man Paul knew as Uncle Ben, Bugsy Siegel. I think my grandfather knew, with the other partners involved, with Ben that he had to keep a real close visual eye on Ben to make sure that his nature, not his intelligence, but his nature didn't kind of stray. Because <laughs> let's face it, he liked to have a good time and sometimes that gets in the way of business. It had always been Meyer who kept Bugsy under control and Bugsy was way out of control now. With mafia money, Siegel was trying to make Las Vegas a gambling mecca on the same scale as Florida, starting with the construction of the luxurious Flamingo Hotel but cost overruns were draining the Mafia's money. Bugsy was running the Flamingo into the ground before it even opened. Only months after Lansky's visit, Siegel was shot to death in Los Angeles. That could not be done without Maya Lansky being aware of it. He had to at least reluctantly nod his head. Lansky always denied signing off on Siegel's murder. I loved him, he was to say later. And as long as he listened to me, he stayed out of trouble. Benny Siegel was dead. Lucky Luciano was also gone, released from prison and deported to Italy. Meyer Lansky was the last of his New York threesome left standing in America, and he had only begun his rise to the top as the mob's foremost tycoon. By the late 1940s, Meyer Lansky had consolidated his Florida gambling empire. He was making millions from the tourists who gambled at his glamorous casinos near Miami and he was sending millions north to his partners in the New York Mafia, who provided the muscle to back him up. But there was one partner he could not manage, his wife, Anne. The couple now had three children, Buddy the eldest, Paul, and a daughter, Sandra. Lansky, always on the move between his Florida casinos and his New York headquarters, wasn't around much. Anne Lansky, forced to manage the family almost on her own, had not been up to the strain. Anne divorced Meyer in 1947. Soon afterwards, she was placed in a mental hospital. She would just sit in a corner in a little room in New York City and maybe recognize you, maybe not. You know, just has no conception of time. You know, you haven't seen her for 10 years. You go knock on the door, she might tell you to leave. <laughs> Come back later. After the divorce, Meyer made a greater effort to play family man. He was especially concerned that his disabled son, Buddy, make new friends. So Meyer enlisted the help of a hospital volunteer who'd met Buddy during physical therapy sessions, Vincent Mercurio. 
Lansky himself soon took a liking to Mercurio and offered him bits of advice when the threesome went out for ball games. Do you gamble? He asked me. I says, no, he says, and never start. He said, because you're always going to lose. And I trusted his judgment because, I mean, he, you're talking to the guy that's on the top of this, and he knew what the percentages were. When asked by friends, Lansky would reluctantly recommend only one casino game. Blackjack. He said, because you have a 17.5% chance of winning. He said, but the others are all sucker games. In 1948, Lansky's games hit a snag. Americans were turning against gambling. Towns like Hallandale withdrew their support. One by one, Lansky's casinos were shut. But Lansky could ride out the crisis. He had stashed millions away. And for once, Lansky's family life seemed to be going well. His son Paul had even been accepted by West Point. Extremely proud of that. That's like playing ball for Notre Dame to my, to my grandfather. You know, your kid is there. Your son made it. And in 1948, Lansky got married for the second time to a manicurist he'd met in Florida, Teddy Schwartz. But when Lansky arrived home from his honeymoon in Europe, there was unpleasant news. U.S. Senator Estes Kefauver had brought his traveling investigation of organized crime to New York. Lansky learned that Vincent Mercurio, staying with Buddy at the Lansky's New York home, had accepted Meyer's subpoena at the door. He said, that's great. He says, did Vince open the telegram? Tell him to go for me. <laughs> so uh, I met him, and he says, you want to go down for me instead? I says, no, thank you. He says, why? I says, I don't know what to say. He just sit there and say yes and no. Which is exactly what Lansky did. He pled the fifth. But the hearings were televised, and for the first time, Lansky's place at the center of the organized crime world was on public display. The investigation concluded for the mob tycoon with a Florida indictment for illegal gambling. Joseph Varon, who had now signed on as Lansky's personal lawyer, told his client to fight. But Lansky, afraid that he might have to testify against his friends in the mob, wanted to plead guilty. Mary said, look, there's a way I can get out of this by paying a $1,000 fine. So let's pay a fine. I said, Meyer, but the other boys that are going to be indicted with you, you're giving them criminal records, and you're giving yourself a criminal record. What's a $1,000 fine? Pay it. A year later, he was indicted again, this time in Saratoga Springs. Again, he avoided testifying by pleading guilty. This time, a fine wouldn't be enough. Lansky spent three months in the county jail. Released in August 1953, he decided it was time to take his gambling racket out of the country. He went south, all the way to Cuba, where gambling was legal and mobsters were welcome. And in 1953, Cuba needed Lansky just as much as he needed a safe haven. Lansky had been dabbling in Cuban gambling for years, but now the Havana tourist industry was threatened by scandal. Many of the casinos were exposed as using doctored games to cheat tourists. To restore international faith in the Cuban casinos, President Fulgencio Batista turned to the one man whose reputation for running a fair game was impeccable, Meyer Lansky, and offered him a job as gambling czar. The little man took the job with gusto and told the other casino operators, clean up or get out. With Lansky at the helm, Cuban tourism exploded Lansky invited his mafia pals to invest, and many did. The Americans were pouring in there, other nationalities were pouring in there. Uh, Meyer made a fortune. Lansky made sure he stayed in the good graces of President Batista. I know that every time Meyer went to Cuba, he would bring a briefcase with at least $100,000. So Batista welcomed him with open arms. And the two men had such an affection for each other. Batista really loved them. I know because he brought, I guess I'd love him too, if he gave me $100,000 every time he saw me. Lansky rented a third home in Havana. He ran one major casino of his own, the Nacional. There he resumed his traditional role, the quiet commander, pacing the casino floor and watching the dollars roll in. And you could almost get the sense of people turning and, and looking and knowing who he was and not saying anything to him, but sort of like the Red Seas party. People don't have to tell you, you just, you know, who, who's who. And he was somebody. 
At the Nacional, Lansky was fussed over by the staff, including waiter Jorge Fernandez, and constantly protected by a team of bodyguards. They would be reading the Havana Post, a newspaper printed here in Cuba. But across their laps, they had a little Smith & Wesson, a little revolver you could not see. It was in case someone should make an attempt on the life of Meyer Lansky. That was who they were protecting. Cuba looked like a sure thing. So in 1956, the man who warned his own friends not to gamble placed his biggest wager yet. He pulled all this money together to actually invest further, reinvest, like the good businessman, uh, in this wonderful hotel, the Riviera. Uh, which was in its day and remains the best hotel in Cuba, the most comfortable, the first one with central air conditioning instead of all those little boxes in the windows dripping water down. Lansky began spending more of his time in Cuba, away from the grip of American investigators. But even the mafia tycoon couldn't stay out of the law's clutches forever. In October 1957, New York mob boss Albert Anastasia was murdered in a Manhattan barbershop. New York police knew that before his death, Anastasia had been looking to invest in Cuban casinos. So they wanted to question Meyer Lansky. Learning that Lansky was making a short trip to New York, the police pounced. Lansky was arrested and questioned about Anastasia. He denied any knowledge of the murder. We couldn't tell him anything. We know nothing about it. But it was just as foreign to me as it would be to an Eskimo in Alaska. As an excuse for questioning Lansky, the police charged him with vagrancy, a technicality that the millionaire found especially offensive. Uh, do you pay taxes in the United States? Oh, yes. Very dearly. But I'm a vagrant. The police put a tail on Lansky. Detective William Graff settled down in the lobby of Lansky's hotel. Within minutes, Lansky approached the cop. He said he wanted to confess to a problem. I know he was playing with me, uh, no two ways about it. And I finally said, I can't get good chickens in Cuba. I said, what, good chickens in Cuba? And then he explained that uh, he uh, had a problem getting chickens to, uh, to feed his guests at the, uh, at the hotel. The poultry shortage did not stop the Riviera Hotel from being a huge success. Lansky's gamble was paying off. He spared no expense, because here he was, legitimate and could see this whole world of Caribbean tourism uh, expanding. What he didn't reckon on were the guys with beards in the hills. For three years, Fidel Castro and his ragged army of revolutionaries had been running raids on Batista's military from their hideouts in the mountains. On New Year's Eve 1958, just one year after the Riviera opened, Castro's forces took control of Cuba's major cities. Batista fled. The next day, Castro entered Havana, Rebel troops took over the casinos, including the Riviera. In January, when my wife and I went there at the, the Riviera Hotel, there were Castro's men sleeping in the hallways, making a barracks out of it. These filthy soldiers with their beards, and it's just pathetic. And that's, I think that hastened Meyer's uh, illness because he had a heart condition and a stomach condition. A year after the revolution, Castro banned gambling and declared the casino hotels the property of the government. Once again, Lansky was out of business. He had sunk almost his entire fortune into the Riviera Hotel, only to have it taken away gangster style at gunpoint. Now, the mob tycoon was going to have to find a new way to make his millions back. After Fidel Castro took over Cuba and evicted the American gangsters from their casinos, Meyer Lansky was at the lowest point of his career. Gone were the millions he had invested in the Havana Riviera Hotel. While he was delighted by the arrival of his first grandchild, respectfully named Meyer II by Lansky's son, Paul, his health was deteriorating. In 1962, he suffered a serious heart attack. Worse, Lansky had now become a target in a clandestine FBI operation. Unauthorized bugs were installed in the homes of leading mobsters around the country, including Lansky's new ranch house near Miami. One night, the agents overheard Lansky remark to his wife that organized crime was, quote, bigger than U.S. steel. That was precisely what the Fed suspected. They saw Lansky as the chief financial officer of a vast secret mob corporation. 
Other wiretaps seem to support that impression, especially the surveillance of a New Jersey mobster named Anthony Jip DiCarlo. On tape, DiCarlo boasted that Lansky had reopened his connections to Nevada gambling, was heavily involved in skimming profits from Las Vegas casinos, and was once again making millions. But Meyer was still safe from arrest. Since the bugs were unauthorized, the feds couldn't use the evidence against the mob tycoon. The FBI had to watch as Lansky went about his daily life, strolling through Miami Beach, having coffee in the afternoon, and going to clubs at night. One act he saw over and over was Jewish comedian Jackie Mason, who came frequently to Miami to perform. I couldn't get over it, that this top man from the whole mafia is following me around. I knew he wasn't trying to kill me, so I figured he must be enjoying my act. After shows, Mason would join Lansky and his friends at their table. He loved the power. I could see he loved the power because when people sat around him with that worshipful look on their faces, you could tell that he knew he was the boss and he acted it. I used to say to him, how much money do you really have? I, I, I swear to you by my life, I'll keep my mouth shut. And he would laugh and change the subject or give me a hug or give me a kibitz. And uh, I could never find out anything. The FBI was having the same problem. Lansky was proving to be an elusive target. So the FBI put together a team of agents called a strike force dedicated solely to nailing Lansky. At the helm was a young prosecutor named R.J. Campbell. One of the problems we had in dealing with Lansky was he was pretty much already retired, with maybe a quotation marks around the word retired, but he wasn't doing anything. He wasn't out uh, committing anything which was even close to a crime. Say. That didn't stop him from being one of the most famous underworld figures in America. His daily walks with his dog, Bruiser, made him easy prey for any photographer. Then, in March 1970, as Lansky returned from a vacation in Mexico, customs agents found in his luggage a bottle of ulcer medicine for which he had no prescription. He was arrested for possession of illegal drugs. A judge threw out the charge, but Lansky had had enough. He decided the best thing was just to to get out and to take asylum uh, where every Jew can take asylum uh, in Israel. Lansky had always admired Israel. When the Jewish state had been fighting for independence in 1948, Lansky held a fundraiser. He also claimed to have used his New York dock connections to stop arms shipments to the Arabs and reroute the weapons to Israel. Now he believed his loyalty would be rewarded. In June 1970, Lansky and his wife Teddy flew to Tel Aviv. In 1971, the Justice Department summoned him back. After 10 years of investigations, the feds had finally indicted Lansky for the skimming of Las Vegas casinos. In Tel Aviv, Lansky was unconcerned. As he had planned all along, he applied for Israeli citizenship. But at the worst possible moment, Lansky's gangster reputation caught up with him. The Israeli press began to take an interest in this Jewish relic of the Mafia world. To escape the press coverage, Lansky moved out of Tel Aviv to a resort hotel on the Mediterranean beach. But the cameras found him there too, just as they had in Miami, out walking his dog. So Lansky granted interviews to reporters in which he claimed he was a victim of media hype. The newspaper man started a campaign against me and it snowballed to such an extent that I guess it can't be stopped anymore. I was singled out for some reason. They needed an image. Some newspaper man wrote an article that I have $300 million. Well, I wish I had a million dollars. The controversy meant that Lansky's application for citizenship had to be reviewed by Israel's interior minister, Joseph Borg. Borg raised the touchy topic of Lansky one afternoon with his boss, Prime Minister Golda Meir. Golda Meir apparently had never heard of Meyer Lansky. As he started to explain who Lansky was or was thought to be, he said the word mafia, at which Golda Meir stopped him and said, mafia, mafia, no mafia in Israel. Israel turned down Lansky's application for citizenship, declaring him a threat to the state. Lansky immediately appealed to the Israeli Supreme Court. Israel needed evidence that Lansky was a threat, and the U.S., which now wanted Lansky back, was happy to help. The Justice Department gave Israel the complete Lansky files. They had first-hand testimony uh, from witnesses who had seen Lansky beat up somebody or participate in beating up people. Uh, uh, so they had a lot of stuff from the 20s and 30s, which uh, 
which had Lansky actually doing a bunch of things uh, as opposed to, to uh, uh, just kind of walking his dog, uh, which is what he was doing in the 1970s. In September 1972, Israel's Supreme Court ruled against Lansky. Well, so long. He was ordered to leave the country. Not giving in, Lansky arranged to flee Israel in secret and to bribe officials to smuggle him into hiding in Paraguay. In November 72, Lansky quietly boarded a night flight that would take him to South America. As his jet crossed the Atlantic, the FBI tracked him down. When he arrived in Paraguay, he wasn't allowed to get off the plane. Every stop that the plane came down to, there was the FBI man standing on the tarmac with the local police chief, making sure that Lansky didn't get off, stayed on the plane, and was on his way back to, uh, inevitably therefore, to Miami and arrest where the FBI would let him off the plane and would surely lock him up. And finally, he shows up in Miami, and of course there's a big arrest, and uh, they can lead him away in handcuffs, and you know, that's the kind of thing the FBI loves. The government finally had a case against Meyer Lansky, and now it had Lansky himself. The aging mob tycoon would be forced to do battle with his own country in the courtroom. Meyer Lansky's attempted escape to Israel had been thwarted. On November 7, 1972, he was returned to Miami, arrested after landing, and charged with contempt of court and income tax evasion. Lansky's wife, Teddy, arrived in Miami from Tel Aviv three days later. Unlike her stoic husband, Teddy Lansky had never gotten used to reporters. Now look, go away from me, I'll kill you, no, I just you won't know. When the reporters wouldn't leave her alone, Teddy used a tactic her husband had never tried. She spat on them. The Justice Department was thrilled to have Lansky back in the U.S. For years, he had been a top FBI target, but Lansky had never been convicted of anything more serious than illegal gambling. Now the feds hoped they could put him behind bars for good. Lansky's first trial was for contempt of court. While in Israel, he had failed to show up when summoned to a Miami grand jury. Lansky claimed that his doctor in Israel had forbidden the trip home to testify but the jury didn't buy it. Lansky was convicted and sentenced to a year in prison, but he remained free on appeal. He still had to stand trial for tax evasion. This case hinged on an unreliable informer, a Boston mobster named Vincent Fat Vinnie Teresa. Teresa told the feds that he had brought illegally skimmed profits from London casinos to mob investors in the States, and he assured his interrogators that on two occasions, he had personally given thousands of dollars to Meyer Lansky. Well, this is the first guy anybody ever testified to putting big amounts of money in Lansky's hands, uh, literally in his hands. And so we were kind of excited about it and, and started to uh, develop a case. Mafia turncoats always make tricky witnesses, but Fat Vinny was the government's best shot at nailing Lansky. The trial began in July 1973. Teresa told the jury that he gave Lansky the mob money on two occasions both in Miami. But Lansky's lawyer, David Rosen, was able to show that on one of those occasions, Lansky was in Boston. The little man himself, whose increasing frailty kept the trial sessions to a few hours a day, never testified. He looked like somebody's grandfather, anybody's grandfather. He looked very, very uh, harmless, uh, uh, and, and uh, he certainly didn't look like an organized crime character. Are you pleased with the way your attorneys handled your defense? I'm sorry, but no comment. Well, you can't blame me for asking, can you? No, I don't blame you at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you. <laughs> the jury was with Lansky. They acquitted him of taking money from Vinnie Teresa. A third indictment for skimming in Las Vegas was withdrawn. Lansky was too old and sick to stand trial. And in 1974, his conviction for contempt of court was overturned. Meyer Lansky had beaten the law. On the streets of heavily Jewish Miami Beach, Lansky became an elder statesman, a living legend. The most pious Jews in the world in Miami Beach were the holiest people to whom God is everything. Even God wasn't close to Meyer Lansky. As soon as they saw Meyer Lansky, forget about God, this was God. They used to worship him, follow him, look at him. If he walked down the street, they would talk about how slow he walked, how fast, did he have a dog, a cow, a horse, did he sit down, get up, what time? One time we're in this little deli down in Miami Beach, and these two young boys came up with yarmulkes on, and they were kind of looking at my grandpa, and I was kind of standing in the background, and they came up and said, Mr. Lansky, we'd, uh, we'd like to get your autograph. 
And he kind of looks at him seriously and knowing my gravity. He goes, well, what did I do, an Academy Award? And I said, well, we figured it'd be worth some money someday, Mr. Lansky. And he said, no, son, I don't sign autographs. Since the 1960s, Lansky had claimed to be retired. Now, as far as the FBI could tell, he really was. With all the surveillance that he had on him, he didn't have even the facility to get involved anymore in, in skimming or any of the other sources of income that he had. And that was, I suppose, the ultimate curse of him living so long that he um, outlived his money and had no further way of earning any more. In 1982, Lansky turned 80. He had developed lung cancer. Joe Varon, his attorney and lifelong friend, pulled a few strings and arranged to restore Lansky's voting rights, lost since his felony conviction in 1950. And I gave it to him for a birthday present. He said, Joe, that's the best birthday present I ever got in my life. Meyer Lansky died on November 15, 1982. There were almost as many reporters at his funeral as there were mourners. When Lansky died, I don't think he had $300,000 to his name. And that sounds like a lot of money, but it was a mere pittance to a man that made millions. It was still widely believed that Lansky had millions tucked away somewhere, a Swiss bank account perhaps, but the money never turned up. Meyer Lansky outlived just about every one of his cronies from the heyday of the New York mob. And he did it the old fashioned way. He kept his mouth shut, even when he talked. Lansky never gave himself away or gave away any of his partners. Very, very careful, very, uh, and, and very smart. Throughout Lansky's career, if you take him way back from the beginning, he was always two, three steps ahead of everybody else. Yeah, he liked having an edge, and I think he liked having an edge, especially on people that were legitimate that he was trying to get over on. So, <laughs> you know, uh, gave him pleasure. He was a very civilized, and a very businesslike individual. Uh, it might sound like heresy, but you could like Meyer Lansky. But though he always said that he never killed a man and was proud of that, this distinction he was making was basically false because the gangster actually lives more on the threat of violence than on violence itself. And all through his life, right to the end of his life, Lansky, with his hard look, delighted in scaring people and knew what the threat was behind that look that he gave. <laughs>